Hello and welcome to Northeast Animal Rights' latest interview in the Saturday Spotlight series. My name is Anna Melia and today we have Eduardo Consalves, who is the founder of the campaign to ban trophy hunting. So welcome Eduardo Hi. and thank you very much. Thank you. Well, thank you very much for having me. <laughs> You're most welcome. Um, if that's okay, we'll go straight on to the questions. So first of all, could you tell me about your upbringing and your vegan journey um, that you went on, which, realized, which made you uh, realise that you wanted to fight for animals? Yeah, well, growing up, and your name, my name suggests, obviously, I'm not from these shores originally. So in Portugal, you know, um, bullfighting is still unfortunately a thing. And I remember growing up and, uh, you know, especially when I'd be around at my uh, you know, uncles and aunts place and the vans would go around at the weekend advertising the bullfights. And sometimes you'd see it on the TV and uh, and I just couldn't understand it. You know, why? would uh, you know you, you want to just uh, tease and torture a, a cow basically um and and get pleasure out of that and i you know and i'd ask my family about this and they would agree that it was totally wrong and that was the first sort of awakening i think i had about the way that you know we treat animals and um and really i suppose all of my life <laughs> and in, in my professional life as well and i've spent most of my time working around environmental issues and animals and so on you know it's been this thing that you know so many of the problems that we face nowadays, whether it's climate change, biodiversity loss and so on, it's all about this fundamental lack of respect for other living creatures. Even a lot of the social justice issues come back to that one fundamental thing. And it's all about us treating, you know, whether it's fellow humans or fellow animals, um, as almost inanimate objects, things that we can use uh, just for our own pleasure or, you know, to satisfy us or to entertain us. Um, and that just seems to be fundamentally wrong. I mean, it, it, for me, it's really about every living thing has dignity and worth in its own right. And so that's something that's really guided me, I suppose, professionally as well as personally all of my life. And it started from, you know, those, those when I was, what, seven, eight years old, listening to people talking about bullfighting. Yeah. So can you tell us about your work with the different organisations and how that's led you to, to set up a specific campaign? Because I know, obviously, I know you from other, other organisations as well. So why have you decided to set up a specific campaign about trophy hunting? Yeah, well, when I did, it was um, almost a sort of a light bulb moment that uh, it was actually about a story that I read in the papers that um, the government of Botswana was going to be bringing back elephant trophy hunting. Mm -hmm. And my first reaction was, hang on, does that mean that there has been elephant trophy hunting and is it still going on? And as I looked around, it found that, yes, it is. <laughs> trophy hunting is a major industry. You know, millions are spent on this you know killing of animals for sport and people spending enormous amounts of money killing animals and then shipping them and having them stuffed and putting them on display and all the rest of it and it was also clear to me that there wasn't a specific dedicated campaign to try to ban it although a lot of organizations are against it there wasn't a concerted effort focusing on this single issue and it seems to be so symptomatic of you know many of the problems that we face today and 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 almost a sort of a glaring sore is such a colonial thing one of those things you'd imagine would be banished to the history books years ago and yet here we are in the 21st century and it's still carrying on and in some ways it's sort of a culmination of the things i've done over the years i sort of had a fairly varied career i worked in journalism um I, i've worked inside government um and i have worked inside parliament and u.s congress um and i've worked for a number of organizations ngos such as wwf um, and i set up an organization called sos links which is to to help stop the extinction of the world's rarest big cat so it's called the iberian links in fact it's europe's only endemic big cat species very very nearly went extinct 20 years ago um, and, and obviously, and I was chief executive of the League Against Cruel Sports. Yeah. And that was a campaign which, of course, it, you know, covers all blood sports and cruel sports, including trophy hunting. But we wouldn't we weren't really doing very much about it. Um, and and of course, trophy hunting really hasn't been a mainstream issue, hasn't been in the press very much until, of course, Cecil. When, you know, when Cecil the Lion was killed by that American dentist five years ago or six years ago now, you know, suddenly the world woke up to the fact that this was going on. Yeah. Um, and in fact, some governments started talking about doing something about it. And in fact, the French banned uh, lion trophies, the Australians did the same. Uh, the, the, the Dutch went even further. They banned about 200 species trophies from coming into the country. So most of the, the animals uh, that tro trophy hunters like to shoot. And Britain at the same time also talked about initially possibly uh, buying lion trophies from coming in. And, and, and then it quietly went away and the pledge was dropped and all the rest of it. And so we were back to a position where this was still going on. And in some cases, numbers were going up at the same time 
you know, numbers of species were going down, although I don't see this primarily as a conservation issue. Absolutely, trophy hunting does have a negative conservation impact, but I think it's much more fundamental than that. It's really about, <laughs> it is something that's just so profoundly wrong, killing animals, living creatures, sentient, sapient creatures, just for entertainment so that we can gloat over them as we, you know, pose for selfies so that we can stick their heads above the fireplace as if it's a normal piece of furnishing. So, um, I mean, and in fact, I'd had to, to step down as the chief executive of the League Against School Sports because of medical issues. I, I developed a, a rare health condition. Uh, but, uh, you know, being medically retired, I sort of found myself a bit bored, really. But also, it was just an, an issue that just hit me in the face. You know, why aren't we doing anything about this? Why is, to, is this still going on? Why do, do we still accept this? And so that was, you know, and I started talking to people like, you know, Bill Oddie and Peter Egan, who I know has been on here, uh, and Chris Packham and various other people, Joanna Lumley, Stephen Fry. We all agreed, you know, Bill Bailey as well. Anyway, we all agreed it was, you know, something that needed to be done something about. And so, you know, we first of all started by trying to do something about uh, the Botswana government, trying to bring back uh, trophy hunting. But it was at that point we realised, you know what, we actually need to do a full-blooded campaign on the issue and being based in Britain the first thing we need to do is to get the government to ban trophy imports so that's what we've been doing and you know this campaign has grown massively and we've had the support of some amazing people obviously Ranul Fiennes has been a huge supporter of ours but we've managed to get cross-party support so you know when I took this to parliament and we started talking to MPs and and lords as well you know suddenly we found that there was a great appetite for doing something on this and we very quickly persuaded the government even to adopt this and it was first talked about in the Queen's speech in 2019 and Boris Johnson tweeted about it and he talked about it Prime Minister's questions and you know Labour had its animal welfare manifesto which included a ban in fact all the main parties included mm. this in their election manifestos in 2019 and then the government had a, a, a consultation exercise organized by DEFRA um, and so it's gone from there and so the legislation is now being drafted um, and it's quite good uh, but it could be a lot better and so we've been talking directly to the ministers and the civil servants and trying to get it to obviously to be as strong as possible because at the end of the day the, the public voters are really clear on this issue. So we, there's been several opinion polls. The most recent one was just a few weeks ago. It said 85% of people in Britain want all trophy imports completely banned. Mm -hmm. And we also need to make sure that unlike perhaps like the Hunting Act, that this is a, a piece of legislation that is properly enforced, so has effective enforcement measures within it and tough punitive measures because it's no point having you know just a slap on the wrist if you happen to get caught. No, we need to be properly enforced and for lawbreakers to potentially fail, face jail time. That is really key. It's got to be tough. It's got to send a signal to the world and it's got to deter people from engaging in this sick barbaric business. Yeah, I think, um, I mean, you've raised some really, really valid points there. I mean, obviously public opinion is massively, it's the same as fox hunting, public, public opinion is massively against trophy hunting and, um, and, and obviously the word in fox hunting as well um, and getting the legislation through it's a kind of like a dual purpose of educating the public to you know raise awareness of what actually goes on and, and make them ask themselves why are, are they allowing that to go on but also to enforce it as well so basically it, we are legislating or you are re, you're trying to uh, push legislation through which is making uh, it difficult for people who break the law or who do these barbaric things um but we mentioned um you talked about the um, like the you know why would people sort of like kill these beautiful animals and just to gloat and have these 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 trophies above, above the fireplaces so what do you think is different about the mentality and mindset of trophy hunters as opposed to other other people who kill animals um you know for, for example slaughterhouse workers uh, they're, they're killing them for food um i mean we know obviously there's, there's alternatives for, uh, for an, animal products but what's the difference between you know slaughterhouse workers or those in the um, in the food industries or vivisection industries and, and, and trophy hunters? Well, I think it's essentially the worst type of animal exploitation and cruelty imaginable, because at the end of the day, there's really absolutely no justification for it whatsoever. Yeah. You know, you, you might be able to argue, for example, that those involved in slaughterhouses, well, they're doing it because, you know, they need to bring in an income. Or, you know, for example, in some parts of the world, say Inuits, you know, where um, it, it's very difficult to have a vegan diet, and that's not yeah. what we're saying that people should have there. But, you know, so you can sort of understand that, you know, there is fulfilling... A, a human need there as well yeah. and bizarrely do you know what po even poaching 
makes more sense than trophy hunting because people involved in poaching are doing it for an economic motiv motivation either because they want to sell the thing or they wanted to sell the product and so on so uh, at least it's sort of within if you like the spectrum of accepted human behavior what we're talking about with trophy hunting is purely killing for entertainment and for the bragging rights it's all about showing off it's all about you know boasting uh, it, it's about vanity um and it's a and and, and it's it's just simply entertainment and fun. I mean, how can you take the life of something and consider that to be fun? And that's the fundamental difference, I think it is. And it's really interesting when you talk to trophy hunters, as I have, in fact, in my, my most recent book, which I'll talk about in a bit. But, yeah. you know, I was talking to trophy hunters and, and, and they, were, they were almost reveling in the cruelty that they inflicted on creatures. Because so many of the animals that are shot by trophy hunters are, in fact injured and wounded they're not killed instantly yeah. and it takes some time for them to die i mean cecil the lion was a very good example that we all know about hours to die actually because this uh, hunter walter palmer the dentist he he shot it with an arrow and he wanted to buy get a special prize that you can get from the hunting industry for shooting big animals with bows and arrows and so he couldn't follow it up with a bullet because that would have invalidated the prize so there are you know the, the industry gives out prizes to hunters who shoot big animals like lions and elephants and everything with effectively novelty weapons, bows and arrows, even revolvers, you know, so handguns. Um, and so, you know, they, they incentivize hunters to shoot animals in the cruelest way possible, uh, just in order to win these particularly prestigious prizes and, and, and so on. So, you know, that's the fundamental difference, I think it is for me, that it, it is purely about reveling in, in the joy. And they, you know, quite often the, the hunters they talk about, um, you know, with almost joy about the injuries that they cause and seeing the animals suffer. And they often talk about uh, trophy hunting as an addiction as well, which I think is very interesting that they get hooked on it. So that there's one trophy hunter who famously said, you know, trophy hunting was like mainlining on heroin. Um, and, and they talk about it as an addiction, something that they can't break away from. And, uh, and of course, we do know that there is a very substantial link between this type of behavior and very serious criminal activity. We're talking about the worst times of you know, murder or abuse of women and children. There's quite a lot of evidence that have been produced by criminologists, for example, and psychologists that establish that link. So it, it really reinforces the point, if you like, that this is a particularly sick activity, literally. Mm -hmm. and, and that's why I think we need to address it because there's something, there's a fundamental malaise there and we need to address that. Mm -hmm. Do you think that um, we're kind of talking about um, an activity which is a very expensive pastime, for want of a better word, to to take part in? A bit like fox hunting, obviously, people sort of like saw it as like almost like a class class divide. Do you think that's the case with trophy hunting as well? Do you think that it's uh, you know that the more wealthy are able to do this? I mean, obviously, we have the royal family who you know William and Harry have been have been mentioned about being involved in ironically conservation, but also trophy hunting as well. So, do you think that the, the public are against it because they see this more as a as a an activity for the wealthy? Do you know one of the things that psychologists talk about is uh, they, they say trophy hunting is a form of costly signaling. So it's yeah. essentially about you know somebody showing off their power, their wealth, their yeah. prowess to their peers. And yeah. yes, I mean, you go on a wild lion hunt in Tanzania or whatever, you could be racking up a hundred thousand yeah. pounds in bills yeah. for the hunt, and then for the you know your flights, and then for the you know the the stuffing, yeah. if you like the mounting of the trophy and the shipping costs and all the rest. Of it. It's a lot of money, yeah. and then to proudly display it, and often they build extensions to their homes. These trophy hunters they can show yeah. off all the animals. You know they've got you know full size polar bears in there and all the rest of it. Extraordinary, even even giraffes and, and elephants yeah. in some places. Um, in fact, there was a trophy hunter in Britain last year who brought home the whole body of a polar bear. So, you know, it, it is about showing off and bragging. So it's that costly signaling. But the other thing is that um, in some ways, the trophy hunting industry has changed somewhat in that previously it was very much exclusively a pastime of the rich and wealthy yeah. and the privileged. And now, particularly with the advent of canned hunting, yeah. So this is where you breed uh, lions, but also other animals, uh, uh, you know, leopards and caracals, another kind of African big cat, um, and, and other species in captivity, in cages, basically. And then you, know, you can hunt them in, a small, in an enclosure, in a fenced in enclosure. And that has brought down the price of lion hunting a lot um, to, let's say, 10, 20,000 pounds. And then the cost can be subsidised further if 
well, when you want to have this mounted in your home, all the taxidermist actually needs is the head and the skin because they then make a plastic mold and that's how you get, you know, a full body of a, of a line and you can obviously just have the head. So that's all the taxidermist needs. So you can then sell or get the hunting operator to sell on your behalf the skeleton of the lion to the traders who, who turn it into lion wine uh, and lion cake, which then gets shipped off to Asia, um, you know, as a status drink, supposedly medicinal properties and all of that nonsense. And, and so there are right now, there's some special deals on the market where you can shoot a lioness, for example, for three or four thousand pounds. So, you know, the cost has come crashing down. I mean, there's some, uh, and because it's been a, a very fast growing industry. So, I mean, 20, 30 years ago, there was only a handful of companies yeah. doing hunting in South Africa. Now there's hundreds of them. And so it's become much more competitive. Um, and there's about 300 facilities that are breeding big cats for trophy hunting and so on, or you know, just, just those. But so there's, there's more competition. And so, you know, some of them offering special deals. So it's a bit like, you know, the DFS sales. So, carpets or sofas or whatever but now so offering you two for one deals on lions so shoot one get one free that is literally what is being marketed at the moment i mean the marketing campaigns the advertising are absolutely insane you should see some of the things and there's now special covid deals on offer as well and and the hunters are saying well there wasn't much hunting last year so the animals are well rested you can come and shoot them or they're waiting for you to come I mean, it, it, it's all, it's, it's almost a satire, a parody of itself, but it's for real. Yeah. So what do you, what goes through your mind when you see another picture of, a, of a, you know, some grinning idiot um, showing off the latest kill on social media? I mean, we've all seen them, you know, um, female hunters, you know, sort of like bragging about how sort of, how skilled they are. Um, I mean, I always sort of think it's, it's you know, a sport or something where it's, it's a, you know, some, both sides have an equal chance of, of winning. Where is this is not a sport, it's completely unequal. So, you know, when you're seeing these um, these people saying they've taken down another animal and they're proudly posing with it, what goes through your mind? Uh, uh, a mix without, of, without of rage. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's right. Yeah, <laughs> try not to. But, you know, it's a break, mix of rage and sadness. And I mean, it's yeah. just so futile. Uh, 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 and yes, they do just brag about it as well, as if they really have achieved something where at the end of the day, it's a, it's a defenseless animal. And yeah. you know, often they're shooting at it from a long way away. Yeah. Uh, so that, it's, you know, that completely negates any idea that it is in any way sporting. Yeah. Uh, and of course, if you're shooting an animal in a fenced in enclosure that it can't escape yeah. from, and unfortunately a lot of trophy hunting in Africa, but also in North America happens in what they call high fenced estates. So there's no way the animal can get away from you. Yeah. Um, and, uh, you know, and these lions as well that are bred in captivity for, for canned hunting, you know, they're basically tame. There's a British hunter from Norfolk uh, who was basically uh, bragging recently about he managed to get right up to a lion and shoot it from a distance of just eight yards. Well, of course he did, because the animal probably thought he was coming to feed it or, you know, yeah. <laughs> it, the, the, these animals don't have the same uh, instinctive fear or, or nervousness or shyness of humans and know to run away. You know, these are animals. That are, it's a bit like shooting, shooting your, you know, your pet cat. And yeah. I mean, I'd say about shooting pet cats, actually, because, you, you know, we, we would say that if somebody was to shoot a, a pet cat for fun, they, they would probably go to jail in Britain, actually. But one of the things that happens a lot is shooting of wildcats. So the Euro European wildcats, African wildcats, so it happens in Europe, it happens in Africa. Genetically, they're virtually the same. So you could go to prison for shooting one thing, you might get a prize for shooting the other. That's how bizarre and completely wrong trophy hunting is. It's almost as if we live in this parallel world. Yeah, I mean, in our area, we've got a problem with um, with seagulls, um, seagull shootings, um, and I run a campaign with the council. I mean, I know obviously this is a much smaller scale, and it's not in terms, it's not like a trophy thing, but it's kind of, it's more just because they're there and because somebody thinks it's fun to do this, you know. So we have these random individuals who are, who are shooting actually from their own, you know, the windows of their own homes, birds which are sitting on the roof or on the outhouse or, you know, on the wall or something, you know. And you just, I just wonder what on earth just goes through the mind, why you would you would do that. You see this bird, this living creature sitting there and you think it's okay to take the knife. It's just absolutely beyond, beyond reason. So I know we talked about, um, you mentioned your books, but you have written quite a few books actually about trophy hunting. So can you tell us, um, first of all, what, what, why you decided to write a book and also what's different about each one? Because I know obviously you've written a few. Uh, well, I decided to write it because there hadn't been a book written about 
trophy hunting in this way and it was a good way to actually get the issue on the map and for people to understand what it's about so um the, the first book was called trophy hunters exposed um and it looked at the industry um you know the industry organizations how they work the money that they get you know where they get it from you know who's funding them and where it goes you know how they're funding for example teaching children to shoot and getting you know, partnerships with boy scouts and so on and so forth I introduced the, the world to some of the world's leading trophy hunters, how many animals they kill, just to sort of get an idea of just how many animals these individual hunters are responsible for killing. Um, and, you know, talks a bit about the hunting prizes that you can get, you know, so awards, um, the award schemes that are out there. So it was a sort of a general introduction to, to the whole industry and how it works, how it operates and the marketing that goes on and how the hunts are sold and so on. The second book was called Killing Game. Um, and that looked very much at the species, at the animals that are being killed and, and the impact that it has on them. So both in terms of the cruelty, the suffering, uh, but also how it's related to you know, the conservation crises that so many of these species now find themselves in. So it was very much a, a book written from the uh, animal's perspective and from the perspective of conservation and looking as well at some of these ludicrous arguments that people from the industry, industry lobby groups and, and say, oh, but it's all very good for conservation. Mm -hmm. You know, as if somebody gets on a plane, flies halfway around the world to kill an animal for fun, but fundamentally their only motivation was they wanted to help save the animal. I mean, you know, who are they trying to kill? Um, so that was the second book. And, and then um, my third book, Trophy Leaks. Um, so it looked at the world's top hunters right now, and it looked at the awards side of things and how it, it fuels the killing of large numbers of animals. And so there are prizes that are handed out by the industry for people who've shot literally hundreds of animals and hundreds of different species as well. Um, and I mean, just one example, and this is actually one of the lower prizes, but anyway, it's called the Hunting Achievement Award. And it's got different um, scales. So if you get the gold medal within the Hunting Achievement Award, you have to have shot animals from at least 100 different species. To then go on to the diamond, you have to have shot animals from at least 125 different species and so on. Um, and it's almost like, you know, computer games where, you know, you sort of get to level one uh, and you have to shoot a certain number of aliens to be able to then get onto no level number two and then level three and so forth. So there's these ladder um, of, of different prizes, like an escalator of killing. Um, and of course, some hunters have won, you know, dozens of these prizes. So they've, you know, some have won 40, 50, even 60 or more different awards for shooting multiple numbers of, of animals in each case and and you have to shoot them from different parts of the world and you have to sometimes shoot them with different types of weapon and so on so it is encouraging you know this slaughter but for entertainment so look very much at those prizes and the hunters who right now you know in, in this year or last year have been winning the top prizes and what they shot the animals that they will have shot and where they will have uh, shot those animals um, and also looked at the dirty tricks um, that the industry uses, particularly at the moment, to try to influence the British government in, yeah. in, in not going ahead with its proposed ban on, on some trophy imports and setting up, you know, fake campaigns uh, purporting to be from Africans who support trophy hunting. Yeah. It turned out to be run by a Republican politician in Arizona. <laughs> <laughs> and he ended up getting uh, expelled by Facebook and Twitter. It was a major thing, actually. It was the first time they'd done anything like that. Anyway, it was all this fake campaign directed at DEFRA, at the UK government, to stop it from going ahead with its ban. So that was, that was... Now, the book I've just finished writing and it's just been published, it's called Undercover Trophy Hunter. Um, and it reveals Britain's top 20 trophy hunters. And so it's very, so whereas the, the previous books were written for a global audience, this one is very much for a British audience. And it says, who are the top British trophy hunters today? Uh, and what have they shot? And um, so essentially I was undercover uh, for about a year. I used to be an investigative journalist in the past. So I spent a, a year undercover talking to these people saying I was a trophy hunter and asking them about their experiences and, and, and they opened their hearts to me. And they told me what they shot and, and how much fun they had and you know how they would take their weapons on planes to South Africa. Um, and they were telling me how they would get the animals shipped home and, and uh, the different 
taxidermists that they used and then I also spoke to some of the taxidermists who themselves were hunters and uh, you know they were telling them about the animals that they were stuffing they sent me photos you know photos of lions and leopards and bears and baboons and all sorts of other animals um, and um, it, it really is a shocking insight to because I think a lot of people in Britain probably think of trophy hunting as being something that is predominantly done by Americans yeah, and yes yeah. Americans are the largest group but there are a lot of British trophy hunters they're everywhere in the country they're from all walks of life as well there's some you know millionaire businessmen uh, others who have you know rather more humble professions um, and Britain also has sales reps for hunting companies operating in Africa and possibly the thing that surprised me most when I was doing the research for it is that the the chief execs and indeed the companies of some of the world's biggest trophy hunting companies are British so they are British owned British managed um, and, and run by Britons so that that also is I think the first time people will have seen that so uh, it, it shows how Britain although we think it's sort of maybe moved on and we're an animal loving nation and so on actually it is part and parcel of the hunting industry and um and there, there's actually a records book so it's a bit like the guinness book of world records but it's by the trophy hunting industry by an organization called safari club international which is the biggest lobby group for the industry um and there's a uh, nearly 900 different categories of record of different species and subspecies that uh, you can get records in and so some of the British companies have got literally hundreds of entries in the records book so in other words clients hunters who've come and shot with them um, you know, they, they basically operate so many hunts yeah. that you know they've managed to get hundreds of entries into this world record the world's sickest record book yeah. simply you know these are the largest animals of their kinds, whether it's leopards or lions or whatever it is. And of course, I mean, this just goes back to the conservation side for a moment, that of course you're taking out the best animals from the gene pool. Yeah. So many of these animals are in such trouble. Mm -hmm. uh, you, know, the, you know, 200 years ago, when trophy hunting, modern day trophy hunting began in urban earnest, there's about 20 million African lions. Yeah. There's probably not 20,000 left now. Mm -hmm. And of course they're shooting the big animals yeah. like Cecil and so on, who are, the ones with the best genes yeah. but the animals that are left behind you know they're the weakest animals the ones that will be less able to cope with these accelerating environmental changes through climate change and, and so on and the populations the subpopulations getting smaller so they will die out and and so it, it it's it's I, I sometimes talk about the conservation side of trophy hunting as being at least as much an issue about quality as it is about quantity. So it's not yeah. just the large numbers of animals that are being killed. It's actually you're taking the best animals out yeah. of the gene pool. So leaving, you know, successive generations with yeah. without those essential genetic resources that species need in order to be able to adapt yeah. and survive in changing environments. Yeah. Yeah, it sounds, uh, I mean, I suppose people are going to be pretty shock, shocked when they hear about obviously the extent of, of British uh, trophy hunting, but. I know um, when we have, um, you know, we have conversations in the press about rewilding, sort of bringing back the wolves and, and you know, species like lynx and everything as well into, uh, into our, you know, our environments. But the other side of it is, is that going to now create another market for those people who want to, to shoot wolves, shoot lynx? Um, you know, you would hope that there's going to be enough protection, but you kind of think it's, it's, it's almost like one, you know, two steps forward and one step back all the time. You've constantly got to keep ahead of it. Um, so I know you've worked with, we mentioned um, quite a few people there who you know, have been really supportive. So how, is, how important do you think having celebrity endorsement um, is with your, for your work? Um, because obviously you have to have an international reach, but also I know that you've, you've won a wildlife award as well. So um, so how important is that to your work? I mean, I know obviously it's a, it's a big achievement for you and it's you know and, and absolutely fabulous, but how does, the, how does those sorts of things help your work? Well, well, with the, the, the award, I mean, it was very touching. It was, uh, I was, you know, really taken aback by it. But, of course, it does help me in then, you know, taking a step further and being, and it encourage, encourages me as well. But, yeah. you know, it, it, uh, but, but also it sort of says, you know, this is who I am and so on. It makes the introductions maybe a little bit easier. Yeah. Um, I mean, you, you talk, for example, to Chris Packham and when he yeah. got that MBE, he richly deserved. And, of course, he's right to use it to be even more forthright and bold about talking about these issues that often people don't want you know them to be talked talked about yeah. i mean yes we've certainly got the support of a lot of high profile people but as well as those you know sort of celebrities if you like you know it's scientists it's you know the inventor of the internet it's people who are conservation experts it's people 
uh, you know, even the, the Catholic bishop, who's the official spokesperson for the Catholic Church of England and Wales, I mean, he's one of our supporters. And, you know, it's very important to have these organisations and everyone coming together, because it really shows that this is something that across the board, yeah. everyone feels very strongly about. I mean, what, we, we talked about the opinion polls a little earlier. One thing that really struck me about the most recent opinion poll was that one of the highest, um, if you like, uh, levels of support for total ban actually came from Conservative Party supporters. So people who vote Conservative, actually 89% of them said they wanted a total ban on trophy imports, you know, whereas the overall national average was 85%. So it really shows that this is an issue that everyone, wherever they live in the UK, whatever class they are, whatever age they are, whatever their voting preference, however they voted in the EU referendum, all of that, they all believe the same. It's almost as if this is the one issue that really unites us. And it's the one thing that universally people feel utter revulsion and feel that it needs to be done away with. So, yes, it's 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 not surprising that there are many public figures wanting to speak out once you explain the issue to them. It's very important to note that, of course, it's, you know, a mixture of conservation groups from all around the world, from Africa, um, you know, you know, leading voices in Africa. I was just um, looking at, a, a, funny enough, just for something else, it's a letter that we did not that long ago. It was to the Secretary of State. Um, and, you know, the number of signatures it had from leading organisations in Africa and conservation scientists from around the world, you know, it, it is time that we all come together and got behind this one issue, because I think that if we understand and act on, you know, the things that are fundamental, fundamentally behind trophy hunting and why it's wrong about essentially our relationship with the natural world, our attitudes towards other living things, other living creatures, about issues of respect and dignity and so on, you know, perhaps it opens a door to really being able to engage with the other issues that we need to engage with as well, fundamentally understanding why you know, our lifestyles on, you know, we, we can't, the, the earth cannot sustain the way that we live and work and play our, our leisure activities as well. We're living in a fundamentally unsustainable way. Everything that humans do leaves a footprint yeah. and by and large, it's a negative footprint. And we need to address that right across the board. Yeah. Yeah, we do. We definitely do. So, how can we, as um, how can we as listeners, help you? You know, help you with your work to ban trophy hunting. Right. There's there's one really, 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 really key thing, and that's get in touch with your MP. Yeah. You know, MPs they are our employees. They are there to represent yeah. our interests in Parliament. We pay for them through our taxes, so we are their bosses. And it is really important to yeah. tell your MP. Yeah. what you think about trophy hunting and what you want them to do and what you would ask your mp to do is either to write to the secretary of state the government whatever to say you know or boris johnson and say i want a total ban on trophy imports and i want it now and i want you know prison terms for those who break the law uh, also you know there are early day motions in parliament so these are almost like petitions that mp yes. sign and these are actually quite influential in terms of the government being able to see what mps from different parties feel strongly about there's an edm which is edm 86 mm-hmm. ban on trophy hunting imports um, and if people can get their MPs to sign EDM 86, that again builds pressure. Mm-hmm. But the main thing is, as I say, just get in touch with, with MPs. I mean, I know that we sometimes have this ambivalent relationship with our politicians and we think, oh, you know, they think they're above us and uh, or they don't listen to us. Well, actually, it's their job. It's their constitutional yeah. job to listen to us. Yeah. And if we don't use that right that we have, we will lose it. Mm-hmm. So it's really important. And, and the other thing as well, I mean, it's quite easy to email your MP nowadays, and that's OK. Mm-hmm. It is even better if you can write a letter or if you can phone them or go to meet them at the constituency event, because that shows the MP, you know, because it's quite easy to just e- bang an email off to somebody and it just mm-hmm. becomes a bit of white noise or you know spam mm-hmm. in your inbox. Uh, whereas if you go to the trouble of writing a letter and sticking a stamp on it and looking at it, putting it in the post- post box, that sends a message in and yeah. of itself. And if you ring up the constituency your office, or indeed you can ring up your MP in Parliament. And there's one central switchboard mm-hmm. in Parliament, and I think the number is 02072193000. You literally ring that number and, and ask to be put through to your local MP. Yeah. Um, and if you go to, if you don't know who your local MP is, it's quite easy to find out. If you go, for example, to a site called write to them.com, yeah. it even allows you to write a letter directly to your MP. You just put in your postcode. Anyway, you know, if, if you can ring them up, talk to them on the phone and say politely but forcefully look trophy hunting is wrong 
it's time to act on it. It is fundamentally barbaric and un-British. I want you to vote for a total ban. It's all you need to say. And of course, MPs hold constituency surgeries. So there you get a chance, you know, to tell your MP to their face. So be be polite. Don't be rude because they'll just dis dismiss you, but be forceful. And, you know, our website, bantrophyhunting.org, has got all of the resources in terms of the arguments, why trophy hunting is wrong and so on, if you need to have those facts. But just go in and talk to them and say, look, this is a really important issue to me. And my vote on who I vote for next time depends on what you're going to say and do about it. <laughs> Because at the end of the day, it's like you hire a plumber or an electrician to do the job. Yeah. And if you don't like the job that they've done for you, you fire them. You don't yeah. hire them again. Yeah. And at every four years or so, we get a chance to do that with our MPs. So remind them, <laughs> remind them and use your yeah. vote. I think actually what you've what you've you recommended there that, that we do is, is, is actually a very, very simple way of getting something through. Obviously, we need to do it in our hundreds and thousands, but it's very simple. We have a very good relationship with our local MP, Emily Book. And, uh, and she's very supportive of all the animal issues I raise with her. Um, and what I was going to say, you've obviously suggested a couple of ways of contacting them. There's all there's, there's right to them. There's and um, they work for us. And find your MP if you just go on those, just Google laws, and then you'll you click on the link and then put your put your postcode in. And it, exactly what you say, it brings up your MP. Um, and you know, so we need to ring them. We need to speak to them. We need to let, write to them a, like a proper old-fashioned letter and email them. You know, if, if you can't do any of those, but it's definitely about keeping the um, sort of like the the um the the heat and the pressure on them really um and like you said just being polite about it it's, it's not really a, a long conversation it's about we want you to support this edm edm 86 or any other issue where you know any other issue where um trophy hunting comes up we need you to register our um our proposal to it um and obviously they are our, our voice in government so you know the 600 mps there and if, if we get a lot of those um on our side that's when the legislation will go through and i think it's really important to have a cross-party um support as well because then you don't have the, the the bipartisan you don't have the sort of like the you know the kind of um the pot people playing the party lines you know with um labor does this and conservatives do that so yeah well and this is an issue where there is genuine and unanimity amongst the, the yeah. parties i mean we yeah. uh, i remember attending a westminster hall debate about trophy hunting mm -hmm. it is the first time in my life anna that i've actually seen politicians from every single party agreeing with each other <laughs> it was quite extraordinary to see but you know we literally i mean and there have been letters in the times and so on which have been signed literally by MPs of every parliamentary party. So every party that's got a presence in parliament, including the smaller ones like the Alliance Party of Northern Ireland and the SDLP and the Democratic Unionists, as well as the Greens and Conservative Labour, Lib Dems, SNP, Plaid, et cetera, et cetera. And I think it's unprecedented. I'm pretty sure there's never been an issue where that's happened before. And the, you know, there's a new all party parliamentary group that's just been formed in parliament as well, chaired by a Conservative MP, co-chair is a, a Labour peer, and then vice chairs from all the other parties and, and so on and so forth. This is an issue where it really does cut across. Everyone from every section of society believes trophy hunting is wrong, except of course, those people who take part in it. Yeah. So shall we maybe end on a positive note, which is politicians actually agreeing on something? <laughs> yeah, isn't that right? <laughs> yeah. So, uh, so thank you very much. It's been an absolutely fascinating insight. Uh, I mean, obviously some absolutely grim stories. They're really, really grim, but we can all play our part. We can all do something to help you. Um, you know, be, it's, it's about being on the right side of history, you know, making the right decisions and, and actually not spending, you don't have to spend too much time to, to help you really. It's a case of making contact with your MP and getting this legislation through uh, and making your voice heard. Um, so thank you very much for talking to us. Um, it's been really, really appreciated this morning. Uh, you know, I know that listeners will be absolutely fascinated to, he to hear the interview when it is. Um, so thank you. Thank you once again. Um, I'm going to sign off now. So this is Anna Malia from Northeast Animal Rights saying thank you very much to Eduardo Consalves from the campaign to ban trophy hunting and goodbye for now. Goodbye from me. <laughs>